Wow. 200. That's right. We have done 200 episodes of Amplify Your Business now. It absolutely blows my mind, but we started this back at the very beginning of the pandemic, and the purpose for Amplify Your Business was really to try to get together as entrepreneurs and share some of the stories, some of the learnings that we have had along the way, and really celebrate the successes, but also dig into some of those failures and really try to understand what makes a successful business. And also to curate this community because being an entrepreneur sometimes can be a very lonely thing. And so it's just really exciting to have this community come together and talk about entrepreneurship. And so Amplify Your Business was something that was created for entrepreneurs by an entrepreneur to talk about entrepreneurship. And I think we've done a wonderful job of that over those 200 episodes. So first, I wanted to share with you that we are compiling all of the best advice and tips and you know some of the lessons that the entrepreneurs have shared with me over these 200 episodes into an ebook that will be released here in the new year in 2023. So keep an eye out for that because we are gonna have that jam full of great, great, advice for entrepreneurs. And the second way I wanted to celebrate is to showcase a few of the entrepreneurs and their stories, some of the episodes that we've done that I thought were really interesting as we were combing through some of the archives in preparation for that book. And so to start out with, I wanted to share this episode or a clip from it anyway. Um, now this is with Vintair. Vintair is a company that's led by Maxim. He is just a passionate guy when it comes to wineries. And so he has an import business. So what Maxim is trying to do is he's trying to create a marketplace. It's actually a two-sided marketplace at the exact same time, which comes with all sorts of different challenges. But what he wanted to do is he wanted to be able to share the stories of the wineries and actually facilitate a smoother transaction there between the wineries as well as the importers and the distributors. And so this interview is definitely one of my favorites. Maxim shares with us in this clip um, some of the challenges that he thinks that he's going to be facing to the growth of his business. So check it out. I think you're going to really enjoy listening to Maxim talk about this challenge. Because we're not through marketers, it's getting crystal clear on, on the value proposition in terms of how do we package and, and, and message it. Um, because when we have, uh, what, like, we've done a number of different pitches, it, it, it's, it's very good practice to just pitch, pitch, pitch. Um, yeah. When we do the pitches, they don't have the hook that it should. Once we have the conversation, a light bulb comes on for a potential investor or, or the audience that, that's in front of us. But it's kind of like, how do we get that, crisp, uh, that crispness of, of the message? Yeah. Um, and then package it and go into market with it. Yeah. Uh, and so if you're, if you're talking a bigger, bigger challenge, it's like, how do we achieve that critical mass where we can then um, put the company on a growth accelerator stage? Okay, for this next clip, I am interviewing Nicole Jensen. She is the co-CEO of Elta ML, an AI company based out of Edmonton. And so I had the opportunity to sit down with her and talk about their business, which is just an exciting, exciting business. They are experiencing so much growth because, well, that industry, AI, is just really taking over business, all different aspects of business. And so they have an exciting business there that she shared some of, of her insights in but also one of the challenges that she was talking about that they have or one of the biggest lessons that she has learned over the years has been that as they have grown her role as a CEO really needed to evolve and change as well and I know Ampla Media, my business is experiencing the same thing and so we've had rapid growth over the last 12 months and that has come with some definite pain points as I've been trying to navigate how do I function as a CEO in this growing larger business. And so I think this here is a great piece of advice that all of us growing entrepreneurs really need to take note of. Check it out. I think one of the biggest lessons um, is that, and it took me a while to learn this one, is that as you grow, your role has to change. Um, a CEO of a 10 person company is very different from a CEO of a hundred person company. Yeah. And the decisions that you should be making at 
your in your position keep changing. So it really is not, it's getting used to giving those things up and handing them over to, you know, a trusted individual in the company, knowing that, yeah. that they've got this, even though it's been your baby for so long. Yeah. You know, I, for a, a long time, we, we weren't the size where we needed um, a people team. And as the people team came on, that was something I was very passionate about. And I still get reminded, okay, Nicole, like, this <laughs> we is got us, this. Yeah, we, we got, got it, it right? <laughs> yeah. um, and it's just yeah. getting used to and being comfortable with the role changing and evolving. Next up is an interview that I had with Barry Ellert. He is the CEO of Windmill Golf. And so they manage a bunch of different golf courses. And when I did this interview, it was right in the middle of the pandemic. And as a public facing or interacting business, they had to deal with, you know, all the different protocols, safety protocols and so on that were necessary through COVID. And one of the things that really stuck out to me while we were chatting was, he was talking about the fact that they didn't really have to implement a bunch of new technology, but what they really found a lot of value in was really leveraging to its fullest capability all of the technology that they already had invested in. And the reason why this stuck out to me is because my business has been suffering from that same issue, and I'm sure a lot of other entrepreneurs are too, where we utilize a lot of different tools, a lot of different technology, but we don't necessarily use them to their fullest capability, which which is really disappointing from just a value and return on that investment perspective, but then also on the lost opportunity or the lost efficiencies that could come from that. So I want you to listen to this, but then also at the same time, reflect on what technologies in your business could you be doing a better job of utilizing to either create some efficiencies or to drive more value that you're getting out of the things that you're already spending money on. Check it out. Did you guys uh, have to implement new technology uh, in order to expedite, you know, the flow of people through and making sure the protocols are being followed and whatnot? Or did you pretty much have everything in place already anyway? You know, really good question. Um, I'm not so sure we had to maximize or, or, you know, install new technology. Maybe we just maximized the use of the technology we had, yeah. but certainly Oh, getting people to pay in advance and, and some of the, our, you know, check-in procedures and, you know, the least point of contacts possible, which w was the most important thing we could do. We've continued some of those practices for sure. We've amplified some other ones. Um, you know, the sanitization of, you know, golf carts and anything that can be touched is absolutely paramount to us. Uh, and it's something that we talk about every day. Yeah. You know, and there's a lot of, um, uh, businesses that have that service component where they're they're interacting directly with the public and and I've definitely noticed a lot of businesses adopting new technologies but uh, like you said there's there's quite a bit of just um, you know fully utilizing what they had in place and and I'm really right. curious because um, it, it forced a lot of people to kind of take that step forward in terms of leveraging technology or leveraging the tools that they had um, where do you think that you guys will be going back to the old way of things or or is it creating efficiencies now in your business that you're going to really, you know, benefit from going forward? Um, really good question. I mean, I think there's definitely been a lot of things that have been learned through this COVID experience. Uh, there's definitely, you know, some areas uh, that we've noticed we can improve that we'll implement moving forward. And then I think there's probably some areas that we would like to go back to, you know, how it used to be, you know, having rakes and bunkers and, you know, things of that nature from an aesthetic standpoint, just really, you know, enhances the overall experience, you know, being able to take your ball and pull it out of the cup, you know, even take a pin out if you would like to. So there's things like that, but overall, you know, golf is golf. It's a game of tradition. It's been the same for hundreds of years. Uh, and we feel like, you know, the traditional components of golf are still intact. So we're, we feel very fortunate and blessed. What's your exit strategy? So as an entrepreneur, we often are thinking a lot about the building of our business, but we don't spend a lot of time thinking about the exit strategy that we're going to have. And if you're like me, you've read lots of books that tell you that you should be thinking about that. My next guest, Ted Curry, is the founder of Insight Strategy. Now, one of the things that he does in his day-to-day -day is work with founders and business owners with their exit strategies and try to figure out how best to basically enhance the value of a merger or acquisition. And so when I had the opportunity to sit down and chat with Ted, 
we started talking a little bit about how do you extract the greatest value for your business as you decide to exit out of it. One of the things that he was saying is that we need to be thinking as business owners five, maybe even 10 years prior to our sale as to what we are going to want to get out of it and then start putting into place things that could really enhance the value so that the valuation at the time of sale, so five years into the future or 10 years in the future, is really going to be maximized. And there's some very simple things that you can be doing as an entrepreneur to lay the groundwork to maximize that value. He shares it with me in this interview. Starting early, like, like you know, there's lots of advice. You see that all the time if you pick up any of the sort of generic business books of like kind of plan to build your business as though you're going to sell it even if you don't because the, the steps you would take to do that typically improve the business's performance and help it become a more, you know, sustainable and, and stronger entity regardless. And I think that is true. So, you know, if you're a entrepreneurial, you know, venture, very founder centric, you know, what are you doing to ensure you've got business processes and systems in place? Maybe even looking at your brand, like how tied is it to the founder? Cause the more tied it is to the founder, the less valuable that business will be when you take it to market. So, you know, even naming your business, you know, if I, if I call my business, Ted Curry and co that's got less value. If, if I'm not there, than if I, if I name the business, something that, that can stand on its own and are you building a team around you? How strong is your management team? Are you investing in management that will allow you to be more removed from the day-to-day -day of the business and an outside buyer, particularly private equity firms look really highly on strong professional management teams. So yeah. those are things I think you can start years in some cases, five, 10 years before you might even want to sell, but have that kind of a mindset of, of what you're putting in place. There's all the other things that I think can give you an extra turn or two on the valuation around, you know, are you in multiple markets? Do you have more than one service or product line? If you don't, can you look to build those, whether that's organically or through your own acquisition? All of those things will set you up better for sale and increase the likelihood of a, of a higher number on the on the valuation. So um, I think what we see a lot a lot is that owners wait too late until they, if they want to sell, it's sort of like, it's a life event that triggers it, you know? So whether that's a, a death or an illness or a divorce or, or those types of things. And the tr problem is then you're doing it usually from a position of weakness and it's a scramble. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you can sort of say, you know what, I might consider selling my business three or four years from now, I'm going to start to put a plan together today, take steps today to increase that. I think the return on that, on that effort, and, and in some cases mm -hmm. investment, if there's financial resources into it, we see really strong returns from that approach. One of my favorite interviews that I've had the pleasure of doing has been with Sarah Goodman. She's the CEO of Chiwis. Now, the thing that really impressed me about Sarah is that she has applied what she learned through rapid growth in the technology industry. So how do you really fuel that growth and, and just the culture that's part of that? You know, you've heard this term probably before where you grow fast and break things. Uh, that's the mentality that is really baked into the technology industry. And so when it came to transferring some of that knowledge or some of those skills into the food industry, she's taken a really unique approach because most people in the food industry grow at a much slower pace, not her. She has some really unique ideas that she applied to it and it's paying off in spades for her. This interview is one of my favorites. Take a listen. Is that something that came from some of your experience in other businesses that you have had before? Because I think when before we hit the record button, you named off four or five businesses that you now have been involved with over the years. Um, so where did that come from? Is that just naturally who you are or was that a learned thing? Uh, honestly, I don't think it's actually who I am. I'm quite impulsive and like to do things very quickly. But I think that when I was like, I've got to do something else. I wonder if this could be a thing. I wasn't sure. And so it kind of became just a little project. And I was like, this is fun. This is fun doing this 99 designs thing. This is fun looking into it. I'm not working eight hours a day just researching I'm just having fun with it whenever and it kind of snowballed and it wasn't until I was kind of confident that I I was like yeah I'm out I'm gonna go do this thing and I um like got a loan bought a couple of um commercial dryers and this had like the smallest corner of a space in Squamish a commercial kitchen space and I started manufacturing and it's very different when you do it in your house with like 
a nine tray dehydrator to these like yeah. <laughs> big expensive machines. Yeah. Um, and I, I had distribution. I had met somebody who ran a distribution company in, in BC and they loved the brand. And so they took us on right away, which is not something like when I did the consulting, I was told you get yourself into like a hundred stores and then you go to a distributor and say, Hey, I've proven myself. Will you take me on? And this, this, I did a course, this was still, while I was in tech. I did a, how to get your product on retail store shelves course. Yeah. And the owner of this distribution company was speaking and he said his email at the end. So I emailed him after I'm like, Hey man, this is my story. This is the package. I get it was the blue and green one that you see now. Um, I know that I was like, I know the deal. Let me get into 75 to hundred stores in the lower mainland. And would it be cool after that, if I reached out to you and he was like, Sarah, it's pretty evident you come from tech and marketing because like nobody has a bag that looks like this when they start and I've never seen anything like it. So we'll take you on right away, which was a, my first huge stroke of luck. Um, that doesn't happen to many people. And I realized that. The yeah, second so, thing, okay, well, but wait a minute now yeah. you're, you're calling that luck, but that doesn't really seem like luck because you were setting things up very specifically from the start. You weren't going with the, you know, the brown organic looking packaging, <laughs> you know, uh, you, you were going with something that was much more professionally designed right off the, the, the hop. Right. So yeah. why did you do that to begin with? What, why did you not take the, the farmer's market route and the more wholesome granola crunching? Well, honestly, selfish reasons. I like my weekends. There's no way in hell I was going to a farmer's market every weekend. Like definitely not. <laughs> I love it. I'm an active it. person and I'm just not spending my time doing that. Yeah. Um, I do think that if you have a product that's very hard to understand, or it's a new type of thing, like if I was the first ever kombucha brand, yeah, damn straight, I would be at that farmer's market. Cause I would have to tell people over and over what this is. They're not just going to pick it up off the shelf. Yeah. These are very simple products to understand. And I also come from a, a tech company with did tons of digital marketing experience. And I was like, do I do a farmer's market or do I just spend some money on digital ads with some, some nice imagery and get it on people's phones to see that they want to try. And for the first, you know, until inception to now has been COVID, it's still COVID. Um, and only until a few months ago, were we able to do demos or anything like that? Like I, yeah. it was really frowned upon for me to even go into the stores and be like, hi, I'm Sarah, the founder of Chini, like to the store manager. They're like, get out of here. <laughs> like, it's a pandemic. <laughs> what are you doing here? Um, so I just wasn't interested in going that route at all. And I, yeah, I had so many people being like, nope, you need to get um, feedback about your products. You need to get feedback about your, your packaging. And I just was like, it's so simple. And I think I got it. Like I did testing. So that's kind of like where I, I don't know. And also, yeah, I just was not doing it. I just couldn't. I just couldn't yeah. do that. I am constantly inspired by the entrepreneurs that I get a chance to interview. And this one in particular was just such an inspiring story. And to no surprise, it comes from Ali Stone, the founder of The Inspired Leader. Now, Ali relates to me in this clip a little bit about a time, a moment when her husband and partner uh, decided that they were going to create a or build a food truck. They had a restaurant business, actually a whole pile of restaurant franchises that they were operating at the time. And he came to her and said, hey, I want to build a food truck, but here's the catch. We're not going to sell anything out of it. It's all going to be given away. Can you believe this? So here's a restaurant that builds a food truck and gives away the food. I want you to really take a good listen to this because I think all of us as entrepreneurs, we are always looking for ways to make an impact on our business, but also within the community. And when we can combine the two of those, we end up in a really special place. And I know that most of you who are listening today have probably given a lot back to their communities. And so you're going to really appreciate what these two did with their business. Take a listen. Being part of a franchise every year, there's kind of marketing dollars that are accrued and you're allowed to spend them in certain ways and we would end up with about a hundred thousand dollars a year to market with and we never really used it <laughs> we didn't really understand a lot about marketing and um so it was in 2016 um my husband went out for a run and he came home to me and he said i have this really crazy idea Allie." and i was like okay and he had a lot of crazy ideas that i had to be like okay temper down chris <laughs> But um, he said, I think we should build a food truck. And I was like, 
I don't know. Like it's been a lot building these brick and mortar restaurants. Like what are we going to do with a food truck? And he said, well, I don't think we should sell anything out of it. I think it should be a community truck. And he's like, you know, we have about a hundred thousand dollars sitting in the bank right now. And if we can convince our partners to use this money for a food truck, we could create a truck that takes care of people who takes care of people. Wow. And it was wild. And I, and when he said it to me, it was like oh, silence in the room, you know, and I was like, I don't even know what to say. Like, that's such a cool idea. It's like the climax of everything we've been working towards. And so it was actually that day we, we had a meeting. So we had a strategy meeting and this was at the time we were working on our values and our, and our missions. Yeah. So this is like a pretty pivotal point in time that this all came out. And we went to our team and, you know, Chris was like, I have this idea and he kind of lays it on the table. And again, just like silence across the room. Like I almost have goosebumps talking about it. Cause it was like, <laughs> you know, it's like one of those kind of moments you're like, did that actually happen? That was so crazy. And everybody was just like, yes yes, let's build this truck. And that was it. We built the truck. So we built the truck. It's called the original Joe's heart cart. It's on the road today. It's on the road to white court today. Um, it's out all summer long. And the only reason we pull it out is because of our team. So our team will come to us with ideas and say, Hey, uh, maybe my mom, um, has MS and she's been in the hospital for the last two or three months. And, the nurses and doctors have taken incredible care of her there. I'm wondering if we can pull out the heart card and take care of these people. And we're like, yes, <laughs> when they come to us with these ideas, we pull it out. So it's at no cost to them. It's at no cost to the recipient. It's all, we just front the cost for everything. As long as that team member comes up with the idea and yeah. wants to come help us take care of people. So it's a pretty, pretty neat concept. And to be a part of one of those events you don't ever forget it. Like I have so many incredible memories, like laughing, yeah. crying, yeah. you know, yeah. just, I don't know. I can't even begin to tell you the human connection that has happened on that heart card. It's pretty cool. Thank you, Allie. And thank you to the rest of the entrepreneurs who shared all of their stories with us as we went on this journey through 200 episodes. It still boggles my mind. So don't forget, we have compiled or almost have it completed anyway. It will be released at the beginning of 2023, this ebook that really encompasses all of the lessons and all of the insights that these incredible entrepreneurs have shared collectively with me over the course of these 200 episodes. It's going to be a unbelievable resource and something that you're going to just absolutely love reading through because I think it can have a huge impact on the growth trajectory of your business. So check it out when it comes out. Until next time, everybody have a prosperous day, a prosperous new year as we turn the pages on 2022 and our 200th episode. Thanks so much.